praise the Lord. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Good to have Pastor Jeff and Pastor Leah back, safe and sound from their excursion north, which was not pleasant because Pastor Leah was sick the whole time, but thankfully she's better. Her weight loss program is not to be tried by anybody else. <laughs> Call 1-800-SALMONOLA-WEIGHT-LOSS. It works. <laughs> It might kill you, but you'll look good afterwards. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. She's feeling better, and uh, it's good to see everybody here. I'm missing some folks. That's just like everybody. Usually they leave when the pastor's out of town. They all showed up last week. Now they're all like, well, he's back. We'll just take Sunday off. <laughs> anyway, well, Paul filled in for Pastor Leah this morning. Discipleship training at 11 a.m. Did a fantastic job. Short and sweet, I heard, but but very informative, very good talk on Job. But I'm sure next week, Pastor Leah will pick the mantle back up and uh, be laying that foundation again. So definitely come out for that. Sunday morning service is always at 11.15-ish. So make sure you get here if you can. We'd love to have you in person if you watch online. Uh, we'd love to see you come and uh be a part of us, and then also uh, Monday night prayer service is at 6 p.m., and that'll be back on this week, so uh, if you have the opportunity to come out for that, please do, otherwise um, join in prayer at that time, and uh, just lift the church up in prayer, and the community, and of course our nation, and uh, after watching uh, Wednesday night stuff uh, from Billy Crone on uh, AI, we definitely need to pray for the nation because it's all going downhill quick. Um, I wasn't here Wednesday because I was out of town. I was in South Carolina on enrollment, so I have no idea what was said last week. So I got to catch up. But that brings us to Wednesday night Bible study, 6.30 p.m. So uh, like I said, we've been covering um, the uh, information from Billy Crone about uh, artificial intelligence and its role that it, uh, it'll play in the end times and all, uh, especially in the Antichrist kingdom uh, during the tribulation. So very, very neat stuff. Uh, and um, it's not something to be scared of, if anything. It just means that the Lord is that much closer to coming back. And um, that's something to be excited about. It's about time. It's about, about to wrap up, praise the Lord. We can get out of here. So they can have this world. I'll come back with him, set up the new kingdom, praise the Lord. And then every second and fourth Thursday of each month is preppers, preparing to meet Jesus, not preparing to enter the bunker, because the bunker won't save you. Uh, everybody remember Y2K? I always think of Y2K. Everybody was stocking up on grains, all right, buying like a year's worth of wheat, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. And uh, everybody just used it for the rest of the <laughs> for the rest of the 2000 and beyond. But uh, none of that is going to do anything, especially in this end time. Uh, so you need to be ready to leave with Jesus, not stay here. And uh, Pastor Lee has been going through really just different topics every every time. Uh, important topics, topics that, you know, every single one of us deal with uh, all the time. And uh, do you have topic prepared see talking about ufos uaps i haven't heard unidentified aerial phenomenon it sounds more technical well anyway she's going to be diving into what those really are because they're not little green men from mars or any other part of the galaxy and uh it's Really, it's demonic entities is what they are, uh, masquerading, propagating a grand delusion. And uh, so come out for that, and that'll be really good. And is that this Thursday? Is that the second Thursday of the month? Yes. This Thursday will be the second Thursday. So come out for that, 1030 a.m. And then um, any other announcements? Oh, yes. Since James is not here to tell. I'll give a, uh, a really good praise report on behalf of one of his friends. So you remember Corey, the tree, um, the tree climber. Christian Corey, yes, Christian Corey, not the other Corey. So Christian Corey, he had an accident while working on his chipper. And um, I don't, 
go exactly how it happened, but uh, something caught the wrench he was using. I think it was like the flywheel or something, and slammed his hand into the side of the chipper and completely crushed his thumb. Uh, so when James talked to him, um, I think it was a week and a half ago, uh, he said that it had it had so crushed the thumb that the surgeon actually thought that uh, they were going to have to amputate his thumb. Because, I mean, it just, yeah. And so he was, you know, talking to James. He was bummed and, you know, he was really depressed because, I mean, yeah, he, he wouldn't be able to do anything. He wouldn't be able to hold a chainsaw. He wouldn't be able to do anything that he does for a living. I mean, his whole livelihood would be down the tubes. And so James said he just felt like he needed to pray for him right then. And so he said, Corey, let's pray about that thumb. And um, he went to, so they did, they prayed about his thumb. And he went to the uh, surgeon, was that two days ago? Yesterday. Yesterday. And the surgeon said, in 20 years, he has never seen bone heal so quickly. He said, not only am I going to have to have it amputated, he said, you'll probably have basically almost the same moment mobility you had to begin with. He said, the thumb bone is healing so quickly and so rapidly. And it, it, faster than children, yes. It will be. Yeah, it will be. So, I mean, that's just that's just the Lord touching him right there. I mean, it, it he said, like I said, and Pastor Lee just said, uh, he had children, he said, don't even heal that fast. And they heal faster than anybody. And he said, it's just, it's unbelievable. And the reason it's unbelievable is because the Lord is healing that thumb of his. So he is still in the miracle working business. So let's keep our eyes on the Lord. And if everybody's ready... We'll have the worship team come up. Shannon, come on up. Praise the Lord. Let's worship the Lord.
shout. Hallelujah. If he's been good, go ahead and shout to the Lord this morning.
a beautiful name it's amazing at that name hell trembles flees yet at that name to us who know him and have called upon him 
It literally is a sweet fragrance. It's a beautiful name. Amen. You may be seated. Can I have our ushers come forward? Are you having children's church or no today? Okay. Thank you, praise team. That was beautiful. Oops, I'm making noise. I forgot not to touch that. Praise the Lord. John, pray over our offering, would you? Yes, amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Praise be to the Lamb of God. While he's doing that and taking up offering, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Hold your Bibles up. Up and down, up and down, up and down. Amen. Declare this to the enemy. Let's say it together. This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. It never changes so that it will change me. Amen. And it's doing that. Let's look at the God's Word to this morning. And our text is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Now, I just want to clarify something. Is ignorant mean stupid? No, it does not. It just means you're not informed on that subject. So Paul's writing to the Corinthians. He says, you need to know about this. Ye know that you were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore I give, unto, wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Father, we come to you once again in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, that you open up our ears to hear and, uh, and our mind to understand that as we go in these series of messages that the gifts of the Holy Spirit did not cease, but they're available today. Although there is a counterfeit, and we will see that as we go through this series of messages. But Father, we just thank you for you being in control, for you being Jesus, the head of the church of which we are the body, and we thank you for this in Christ's name. And the church said, Amen and Amen. You may be seated. Praise be to the Lamb. So the title of today's message is simply this, Spiritual Gifts in the Body of Christ for Ministry and Worship. See, this message is the first on our study of our study of the gifts as given by the Holy Spirit. For as to their purpose, we will see what this is, and as to why they are needed in the body of Christ today, as we go forth in these series of messages, you'll understand that the gifts did not cease as though some teach. Although there is a great abuse, in fact there's a counterfeit, not only an abuse of the gifts, uh, but a counterfeit to them. And the first thing we'll need, we need to have as we go into these series is to have a sound biblical understanding of spiritual gifts. For it is essential for a Bible-believing church. And then according to the New Testament, spiritual gifts have their purpose place in the life and ministry of the church. Where spiritual gifts are denied, separated from community, that means they're not being uh, done for the edification of the body, that's what we mean by community, or otherwise abused, the body of Christ suffers and suffers greatly. The gifts then we'll see of the Spirit are crucial to the very life of the church as Paul's letters plainly reflect. Let's look at some of that. Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8 proclaim, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, who gives them? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the Holy Spirit gives those, and they're gifts of grace. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the faith, according, excuse me, to the proportion of, of, of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our minister, ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. In other words, don't have an ulterior motive other than I want to honor the Lord with my first fruits. He that ruleth with diligence, and he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. And then again we see this in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 in the chapters. But now look, that's just as we go in these three chapters we're going to study. But look at uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, chapter, or chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying. 
Now I want to say something about quench not the Spirit. Do you understand the Holy Spirit will not override your will or your physical uh, 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 acumen, your physical capabilities, whether it's in your mind or your body. He will not do that. You remember back in the 90s and, and even today there's, it's a growing movement where you got craziness that goes on. But going back into the 90s when you had the whole Pensacola movement, even in the church of God, so many of our ministers and laity were falling prey to that. I stood against that, and I, I don't say this with so that you say, hey, way to go, pastor. I'm just telling you like it was. I stood against that and had a lot of people come down on me, but it was for this reason alone. If you are jerking and you can't stop, that's not the Holy Spirit, that's another spirit. And only that, I was, I was basing it all mostly on what they were teaching. It did not line up with Scripture. So if you're teaching something else and you have all these manifestations, what's being produced is you're teaching another Jesus that Paul warned is anointed by another spirit that will be produced and, and propagated by another gospel. Now, it's not that there's more than one Jesus. We know that. There's only one Jesus Christ crucified and risen again, seated at the right hand of the Father. It's not that there's two Gospels, there's only one. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, went to the uh, grave, and, and, and spoke to those that were held captive in what we call Abraham's bosom, and then spoke to those spirits that were in chains. In other words, saying, gig is up, your eternal destiny is hell. Uh, see you later when I cast you there. And that he is risen again in authority and power, and that we are his body, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father and makes intercession. Let's go on next to the next scripture uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13 says this. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now go back to verse 11. I want to point something out because what inspired me to teach on this is there is... Uh, uh, teachings out there that these gifts have ceased and not all these offices are available. Now, if you look at the uh, uh, where he gave some apostles, notice this is all to the edifying of the body of Christ. Did he mean just for the body that existed before the end of the first century A.D.? No, because the body of Christ has been growing for 2,000 years. Do you not think we need to be have uh, leadership and sound guidance in the Scriptures? Of course we do. But the office of, of apostles is not the same as it was in the first century A.D., nor the office of prophet. In the, Old, in the Old Testament, the office of prophet was foretelling what God was going to do because there was not the fulfillment of Scripture. We did not have all the Scripture. Not all the light was given because the church wasn't even here yet. But the office of the prophet today is not foretelling, and anybody that goes around foretelling, it's fortune telling, and that's forbidden in scripture. But it's foretelling, it's proclaiming, it's edification of the body of the individual in the word of God. That's what the prophet does today. And of course we have evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now look at Galatians 3.5 with me real quick. He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. So you see, it's not that it's a formula. It's not uh, by the works of the law that these things are done, but it's by the leading and movement of the Holy Spirit. That's why it behooves us to be in the Word of God so that we can be led by the Spirit of God because the Holy Spirit is always active in moving the body of Christ in the direction that centers upon Christ's finished work on the cross. But that being said, there's a counterfeit. There's another spirit that's always moving. And what a counterfeit. What makes a counterfeit so tricky and so uh, dangerous that it looks so much like the real? That's why we have to, and as your pastor, I'm constantly telling you, read the Word of God so you know the difference. So you will not be led astray. Amen? That wasn't in my notes. That's all free. So take, take that and munch on that for a while. Amen? Say, a church that gives no place in its life and ministry to the exercise of spiritual gifts has departed from the biblical norm. The church of Acts is the pattern for the church, not only in Paul's day, but for our day as well. In fact, every church should be Pentecostal. Now, I'm not talking about uh, anything that's going beyond Scripture. I am what is called a classic Pentecostal. Although, even though I'm in a Pentecostal denomination, many of our pastors are no longer uh, what I would assume and declare them to be classical Pentecostal because they've been influenced far too much by the charismatic movement 
which in my opinion and my studies for over 30 plus years in the ministry is that it's the counterfeit as a whole. I'm not saying everybody that's in the charismatic movement is wrong, but as a whole that movement is a counterfeit by Satan to, to steer and veer the church into that which would cause its own destruction. Now let's move on and look at this. First we need to have sound biblical understanding of spiritual gifts for it is essential for a Bible-believing church, and we know this. Now, secondly, the purpose of these messages, messages that I'm going to be given is to understand as to, the, as to the distribution and working of these gifts as they pertain to the edifying of the body of Christ. And this, then, will answer as one of the answers of why the gifts are needed. So now let us begin our journey into the all-important yet often misunderstood the spiritual gifts given to the church by the Holy Spirit. First note, verse 1, where it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Look at the first part of that verse with me where it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren. Here Paul's referring to the, the nine gifts of the Spirit as outlined in verses 8, 9, and 10. In addition, there are other types of gifts as in Romans chapter uh, 12 listed there. In reality, everything we get from God is a gift. Have you ever thought about that? What's the first gift we were given? The forgiveness of sins. He paid, Jesus paid the penalty of what was due on each and every one of us. Each and every one of us were born separated from God. Somewhere, even when an infant dies, and I believe they're, they're not died lost, as some teach, especially the Calvinists would say that. Isn't that wonderful? How do you comfort a family that just lost a child, especially an infant, say, well, maybe they weren't part of the elect. No, that's garbage. But somewhere, that child has to have the sin nature dealt with because you're born with a sin nature, right? Now, I don't know how God does it, but somewhere, that child is in heaven, but that's already been taken care of. And could it be because Christ is still ministering in heaven? heaven's temple he is still interceding for the believer so when a child dies before the age of accountability I believe they go to be with the Lord and that that whole uh, idea of the sin nature is dealt with but it's still dealt with by the shed blood of Christ now that was uh, not in my notes but I just thought I'd add some clarity to that you see everything we get from God is a gift now spiritual in the Greek here is pneumaticus meaning non-carnal in other words, not human. Okay? Spiritual it is. In other words, things of the Spirit. So Paul's saying, now concerning things of the Spirit. That's essentially what he's saying here in the first part of this verse. Now concerning spiritual gifts. And the second part where he says, I would not have you ignorant, proclaims the Spirit of, the, of God through Paul saying, he didn't want the church at Corinth to be ignorant concerning these gifts. Yet a gross ignorance does exist concerning these things. First, in most churches, people know nothing at all about them. Can I tell you something? We already know that much of the, well, all the mainline denomination uh, disregarded the gifts and the leading and the moving of the Holy Spirit uh, a century and a half ago. But do you realize, even in our own denomination, we're the second largest Pentecostal denomination in the world, and it's been at least at least maybe 15, maybe 20 years since I read this, and I believe it was by Barnum, took a, a survey of Church of God pastors. And back then, not even half said they had the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance. As we go through these, I'll tell you there's a difference between the Spirit giving the unction and you bringing it forward yourself. That's one of the major distinctions in the pen, between Pentecost, true classical Pentecostalism, and the charismatic movement. Now think about that. We're to be a Pentecostal church. Now I'm going to tell you something else. Many of our pastors don't even believe in the inerrancy of Scripture today. That's in the church of God. And if you think it's just our church that's in trouble, no, that's the evangelical church as a whole. Look how many people since the Supreme Court of the United States against God's word proclaimed that 
same-sex marriage between two men or two women was fine. Now it's opened up a Pandora's box. You already got someone in California, a, a father and a daughter, suing the state to be allowed to get married. Because once you define marriage as anything goes, then who's to say they can't? But I am surprised at how fast the evangelical church apostatized after that ruling was made. People I never thought would agree with that said, well, as long as it's monogamous, as long as they love one another. That's not what the Word of God says. God hasn't changed His standard. But we are living in the Laodicean church age, and that's the church of what? Compromise. And the moment you compromise for the sake of unity, you do not have unity. Listen to me, people. You have heresy. You cannot compromise the Word of God so that we all come together under one banner. That's called ecumenicalism, and Jesus never taught ecumenicalism. What He taught was the, the uh, universal brotherhood and love and by the universal, universal, I'm not talking about mankind in general. I'm talking about those who are born again. We are to love one another. And we can come and have fellowship around the base of the cross. But apart from that, I cannot have fellowship with you. Not because I don't like you, because I'm going to stand upon the Word of God. You're operating under another spirit. Who remembers promise keepers? I didn't like that whole movement either. You're going to say, Pastor, you're really not very... You don't like anything. No, that wasn't the case. I cannot walk hand in hand with people who, who follow Catholicism, who were Mormons, who were Jehovah Witnesses, and have fellowship. Now, I can unite around all people around a common political cause if it advances the kingdom of God, but that's different than having fellowship. You understand? Because fellowship implies that we are having fellowship because we're under and in, we're under the headship of Christ and in His body. And unless you're born again, you're not part of the body of Christ. Obviously, I wasn't very popular for that stance either. But I digress, and let's get back to the message. See, some teach that they are no longer applicable for this present time, the gifts of the Spirit, and cessation doctrine there. The truth is that as long as the church is in the world, it needs the gifts in operation in the hearts and lives of believers because we're still fighting the same enemy. If anything, it's become greater, the battle's heated up because the enemy knows his time is getting short here on this earth. And I'll tell you, your greatest conflict is going to come from the professing church. Mark my words on that. It always has. If you go and look at the Fox's Book of Martyrs, and it talks about it's estimated around 60 million people were killed by the Catholic Church during the Inquisition that lasted about 300 years. By the way, you can check this online, the Office of Inquisition has never been closed. Hmm. Can you say it being revived and see it being revived? Can you say the tribulation period? When those who are serving the Antichrist, who think he's the Messiah, who think they're doing God work, God's work, will wholesale slaughter everyone who comes to faith in Christ during the tribulation. But be a good cheer. If you're saved right now, you're not going into the tribulation. Jesus already took the stripes. That's God's wrath. Yes, the devil comes down halfway through the tribulation with great wrath. But you must understand, everything the devil does... God has used it to propel His plan. I'm not saying God authors sin. God does not do that. God is not the author of sin. But one of the greatest things that will torment Lucifer, Satan, forever is knowing that everything he did to thwart God worked to his own demise, his own defeat, and his eternal damnation. You see, ignorant in the Greek is agnaeo and it means to not know, not understand, through a lack of information or intelligence. So now let us understand the general nature of the gifts. The gifts of the Spirit must be distinguished from the gift of the Spirit. You see, the former gifts describe the supernatural abilities imparted by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, for specific ministry. The latter refers to the impartation of the Spirit to the believer by the ascended Christ. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, He has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. In other words, Jesus said, I must go, remember, He told them, so that I can send forth the Comforter. Because now, 
Jesus through the Holy Spirit indwells the believer. That's why we do greater works than he did. He was limited by his physical locality, time and space as the second Adam, as the Messiah, as the Redeemer. But as his body, where's the body of Christ? Is he just here? Boy, I hope not. I'm really disappointed if this was it. I'm more so disappointed than I could ever be. No, he's here. He's elsewhere in this town, in this uh, uh, state, and in this country, and around the world. You see, the body of Christ is, encompasses the globe. So you have the body of Christ. What is the purpose of the body of Christ? To proclaim, first and foremost, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then to stand and work in the power and move in the operation and being led of the Spirit of God, like I said a moment ago, in power, so that the redeem or the law shall be redeemed. That's it in a nutshell. You see, Paul speaks of the gifts of the Spirit in threefold aspect. And the first is, and in, in with the, in the Greek word that describes charismata, this pertains to a variety of gifts bestowed by one spirit. And then diakonia refers to the varieties of service rendered in the service of one Lord. This is one spirit, one Lord that we do our work in, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then energinata speaks of the varieties of the power of one God who works all in all. And ever, in other words, as we go through the study of these gifts, they're for one purpose and one purpose only. Not so that you look... So people can look at you and say, boy, they got the power of God. No. It's so that the body of Christ is lifted up and edified always in Christ and empowered to do the works of God, empowered to take the gospel, empowered in our everyday walk and life, empowered where we work to shed the light of the gospel just by the very fact that we live and breathe and they can see Christ in us. That is the power and that is the purpose of the gifts given to the body. Amen. See, all these aspects are referred to as the manifestation of the Spirit, which is given to men for the profit of all. Can anybody else feel this? I feel the Holy Spirit in this message. Can anybody else feel that? Or is it just me up here? So that leads us to the question, what is the main purpose of the gifts of the Spirit? Well, they are spiritual enablements for the purpose of building up the church of God through the instruction of believers and the winning of converts to Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, 7 through 13. Look at that with me. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. You were given grace when you were saved. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. That was referring to what I just talked about a moment ago. He led captivity captive. Remember prior to cross giving his life on Calvary and the shedding of his blood, when those looking forward in faith to the Messiah they were still held captive by Satan, although not in the torment side of hell. Remember, we have that. But in that, what we called Abraham's bosom, they were still trapped. They could not go to heaven. Why? Because the blood of bulls and goats and heifers and bullocks could not wash away sin. It covered it. Where it does more than cover now, what does the blood of Christ do? It washes us as white as snow. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this, but you realize snow has no color. Y'all realize that? You say, you're crazy. It's white. We see it. No. It's crystal clear. But you know why snow appears white? Because it reflects and absorbs the light of the sun. See, we're snowflakes, not the crazy snowflakes of the millennium. Because as believers, we reflect not light that's in us, but we reflect the light that's in us because of Jesus Christ. In other words, it's His light. Isn't that amazing? You want to be that kind of snowflake? I hope so. Reflecting the light of God. See, these gifts in verses 8, 9, and 10 may be classified as follows. Three of the gifts say something. In other words, tongues, interpretations of, of tongues, and prophecy. Then three of the gifts we see reveal something. The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the discerning of spirits. And as we go through each of these nine gifts, I'll give you more, and we'll talk more about them. And then three of the gifts do something. Faith, the working of miracles, and the gift of healings. 
But now notice in verse 2, ye know ye that ye were, excuse me, ye know the, ye, ye know, ye know that ye were Gentiles. I don't know why I'm tripping over that. Let me ask you something. Let me see a ra everybody raise their hand who uh, was a Gentile. <laughs> Unless you're Jewish and a Jewish convert, you're a Gentile. Amen? We're all Gentiles. But this carries with it all the connotations of acute spiritual ignorance. You see, the word Gentiles describes with it a history which does not include God, but rather gods of their own making. And how much do we see that? People who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, and even those that claim they worship a God of their own making. Hence another Jesus. We see that all the time. I encounter that all the time on a weekly basis. That people say, oh, I, I believe in God. And then they talk about how God's in the trees and everything. No, that's not God. That's worshiping the earth. Gaia worship. But you see, it's no different today in the church. And those who profess these Gentiles refers to all people of every nation other than Jews. Carried away with these dumb idols tells us that what these Christians were before conversion, what they were before conversion, they were led by superstition, witchcraft, and all of its many forms, all being under control by the powers of darkness. Even as ye were led, mean that they ought that they sought at counsel or sought out counsel from their idols about nearly every decision of life. And you know, most of the world continues to follow suit in this. Astrology is a case in point here. Let's look at Isaiah 47, 13 real quick. Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now thou astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognostic prognosticators, stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. In other words, in other words Isaiah was saying they're not going to help you. They're not of God. They're not... Uh, empowered by God. They're not led by God. They're dumb idols. There's nothing when God moves upon to bring his wrath down upon you, there's nothing these gods, so-called gods or idols will do to procure you and to keep you safe. Many believe that the position of the stars at a person's birth influences the, their life. People read the uh, the uh, astrology pages all the time in the newspapers. Now they try to probably read them online. Newspapers, all printed publications are going by the wayside. The only thing that's still being uh, printed much is uh, our books because they have found people just don't like holding a laptop. It's not the same. The majority of people like the idea of having a book and turning the page. But that's what people do. It's amazing how many uh, Christians I talk to, and they're probably believers, but how much superstition they still have in their lives. Who's afraid of Friday the 13th? I bet you don't walk under a ladder, do you? And I don't think that's necessarily stupid superstition. I think that's just wisdom. Because somebody's up on a ladder, you don't want anything falling on your head. Especially they're up high and you drop a hammer, it's not a good day for you. But you know what we call old wives' tales are nothing more than a lot of superstition. I got a friend that when he was a kid, there was a lady that practiced um, calling fire out of your body if you were burned. Anybody know what I'm talking about? She would do all kinds of stuff and call the fire out and the pain would go away. Well, what she was doing was cavorting with demonic spirits. She didn't give Jesus the glory. She said, the, and, and uh, everybody that ever got burnt was taken to this neighbor lady and she would heal them of their burning. Doing a, which is not more than witchcraft. But it's amazing how much of this stuff still infiltrates our lives and why we need to eradicate it. But what does the Bible say about these things? It is absolutely forbidden. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 10 and 11. There shall not be found among you anyone, what's any mean? 
It means all, doesn't it? Anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. Can I tell you something? If you have dealt and even looked in times past in any of this, Make sure you've got it under blended. You've repented of that. Because I'm going to tell you something. That stuff right there runs rampant in today's church and people who claim to know the Lord. Now, there's always been a great theological debate that when Saul consulted the witch, of, was it the witch of Endora? To have Samuel come up and Samuel appeared and she screamed and and because she they say because it had to be Samuel because she recognized it was really Samuel. I still don't think so. I fall into the other camp because God would not, in my opinion, go against His own word. And the Bible's clear: once we die, then the judgment. Once we die, as a Christian, you're now, because of what Christ did on the cross, in the presence of the Lord. So you're either in heaven or you're in hell. And remember when uh, Jesus was um, talking about the rich man Lazarus, and the rich man was in hell, and, uh, and the burning side, and Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom, and the rich man said, send Lazarus over here, Abraham, Father Abraham, send him over here so that he can dip his t uh, finger in water and touch my tongue. And Abraham said, there can't, there's a gulf here. We, you can't come over here. I can't go over there. Then he says this. Well, then send Lazarus back to warn my brothers. You see, he, he knew all his brothers were going to end up where he is. But what did Abraham say? He said, we cannot. And even, paraphrasing, even if I did send him back, they wouldn't believe him. He said, they have the prophets And those who are given the word of God. They had the Torah, they had the prophets to warn them. He said, even if he went back, they wouldn't believe him anyway. But notice they could not go back. So, anybody that says that uh, they communicate with a lost loved one, son, daughter, husband, wife, grandmother, grandfather, grand, uh, mother, dad, anybody, you're not consulting with them, you're consulting with a familiar spirit. And it's forbidden. Why is it forbidden to, to even try that? Because Satan's got untold numbers of demons who are more than happy, called familiar spirits or other things, to trick you and dupe you into thinking you're talking to that dead loved one with the sole purpose of leading you to eternal destruction. Because you will contact something, but it won't be your dead loved one. It'll be one that's impersonating them. You see, de demon spirits have been around for your whole life, your whole grandmother's life, grandfather, anybody that you can think of, they know all their peculiarities. They were probably listening, so they know just things that nobody else would know. That's what dupes people. But the reason they're duped is because what? They don't know or they don't adhere to the Word of God. So, we clear on that? Don't mess with it. So it's clear in Deuteronomy 8, 10 through 11. And we'll quickly move on. Notice the manner in which believers are to be led. First and foremost, the Word of God rightly divided and studied. That is essential. I don't care how many goosebumps you get. I don't care how spiritual it sounds or, or it feels. We don't serve God by feelings anyways. The Word of God is the criteria. If it goes against that, goes beyond that, then don't accept it. Because the Holy Spirit will never circumvent God's Word. He'll always honor it. And then also by the indwelling Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit bears witness to truth and rejects what is false. I'll give you an example. Back early, uh, the first, well, we weren't even married six months, but I was when I was at Trinity College, uh, even though I was on the liberal arts side, Trinity Seminary at that time was the lar second largest seminary, evangelical seminary in the United States. They had like 25, 30,000 seminary students. But we all had to attend chapel on Wednesdays. If you lived there, you attended chapel. And we had this guy, and I knew what he was preaching. Some of it sounded good, but there was something, there was what we call a check in my spirit. It just didn't settle with me. I didn't know exactly what it was, 
But it was so uneasy until later on I found out because I read his book. He was a, uh, a uh, what we call that, um, what Pope Francis is. Not dominion theology, but uh, what's the word I'm looking for, somebody? Liberation theology. Thank you, Lord. Which is basically communism, and that's what he was. And, of course, then I, uh, not only did I read his books, but the scriptures he gave in his book as to bolster his, uh, his whole idea of what he was saying were completely taken out of context. But that's an example of being led of the Spirit. I felt a conviction, a check, if you will, in my spirit. At the same time, that was, or let me, before I say that, that was an example of the Spirit saying reject this because it's not true. Even though I couldn't tell you right then and there, but later on, I was able to tell you that within a couple days. But how many times have you met someone and you knew they were a brother or sister in the Lord? Well, that's the Spirit bearing witness with what? It's bearing witness with one another because the same Holy Spirit that's living in you is living in that person. Therefore, you have instant fellowship. That's what's great about being a believer in the body of Christ. When you meet somebody, you can be on the other side of the world and not even speak their language and you can have fellowship. Why is that? Because you have the same Spirit of God living in you. That's being led of the Spirit. And, then <clears throat> and the other is the insights of other Christians. It, it is good to listen to other Christians as long as they're lined up with Scripture because especially the older ones. That's why Paul, uh, writing to Timothy, said the older men need to teach the younger men. Now, why is that? Because if they've matured in Christ, and that's really what he meant by older, then they have lived through experiences. They have got understanding that is desperately needed. There's a future drummer right there. That are desperately needed in that younger person's life. The same way he admonished for the older women, the mature women, to teach the younger women. Because you've lived through life's examples. You've lived through different, different uh, hardships and you've come out on the other side. You've, you've been tested. You've been through the fire. And you just gained some wisdom. Even non-believers just living in life can have some good wisdom. Have some insight. But it's always predicated on God's Word. Always keep that in mind. And then the proper use of our renewed mind. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world. Now, what's it mean by this world? Anybody? Does it mean do not become round like the globe, the earth itself? But the world system, right? The attitude of the world. The way the world does business, quote, unquote. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, how do we renew our mind? First and foremost, get in God's Word and study it. Then listen to good Bible teaching. But what keeps you on track is because even a good Bible teacher can be wrong every now and then. There's things that I believe 30 years ago I've gone back and said, you know what, I didn't have that right. It was based more on theology than biblical, sound biblical doctrine wasn't heresy or anything like that, so don't, don't be alarmed. But be transformed by the what? Renewing your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do you want to know how many times have people asked me over the years, I want to know what God's will is for my life? Well, over the years, I'm more and more convinced it's really not that difficult to find out. Read this. You know why? Because as you're reading the Word of God, what's happening? Your mind is being renewed. What, and think about it like this. It's being tuned up to hear and be led by the Spirit of God. But if you don't know what God's Word says about different aspects, the Word of God covers every aspect of human existence, life, relations. But as we renew our mind, then we become very tentative at to hearing and being led by the Spirit because remember, the Spirit of God will always lead you in accordance to the Word of God. It's reciprocal. And once you have that mind, guess what? You won't question what's the will of God for my life. 
you'll find that, even if it's whatever the occupation. And usually that's what people mean. Because first and foremost, the will of God is that you glorify God. You don't have to be a theologian to know that. That's the will of God. But most people, you know, what's my purpose? What, I, what I'm, am I to do? Sometimes, anybody asks me that again, you know what I should say? I believe it's God's will for you to come over and mow my lawn every week. They would reject that probably, wouldn't they? And rightly so. Finally, verse 3. Wherefore I give you to understand, has the word wherefore linking the two facts together. First of all, Paul in essence is saying, because it is true that you were once misled and cheated by your old religion. Second, for the very reason I want you to know <clears throat> that in Christ, but excuse me, that in the Christian experience, everything is entirely different. And what a glorious difference I would say it is. Amen. That no man speaking of the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed tells us three things. First, if a man is truly born again or a woman, the Holy Spirit resides in that person. The Holy Spirit will never contradict himself or the Word of God. Or be divided from the other two members of the Godhead. There's perfect unity. You know, Holy Spirit's not going to say, you know, I had a bad day yesterday with the Father and Son. No. There's perfect unity there. Consequently, that person will never speak lightly of Jesus, much less curse Him, but rather glorify Him. You know, it's always a telltale sign to me when you meet somebody and they talk about the big man upstairs or some other cheap euphemism they give for God, that pretty much lets you know they're not really talking about or really don't know God. Because when you know God and you know Jesus, he's not the big man upstairs. And Jesus, um, I even hate the term, oh, he's my big brother. And, 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 and yes, that's true to a point. But the problem in the modern church, in the Laodicean church, they have so overemphasized the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ, which he's fully human. To the detriment, though, that he still and always has been and never has ceased to exist to be fully God. He's not half God. He's not a hybrid, half God, half human. No. He's fully God. But to redeem you and I, he had to become one of us. First and foremost, God can't die. That's why Satan could not figure out. He knew God couldn't die. So how was God going to redeem this precious thing he just created? I was cackling there in the garden. <laughs> but it didn't work, did it? He could not fathom that God, the second member of the Trinity, would take on the form of humanity because as a human being, Jesus did what? He died. He really died. He had to because death was due on each and every one of us because of the very fact that we were born with a sin nature. Have you ever found anybody that's still alive that hasn't died yet and they were born 2,000 years ago? No. That's why the whole transhumanist thing, they think they're going to attain eternal life by downloading all their, their uh, mental and their personality and everything about them and then they'll just upload themselves in a cyborg, uh, a new created uh, flesh bot or whatever you want to call it now. See, because they reject this, they don't know this or probably most of them never read it that it's appointed unto man once to what? To die and then the judgment. Now, for those out there saying, I got you. How are you going to go in the rapture if you don't die? I'm glad you asked that. Mr. Doubter and Gainsayer, Mr. and Mrs. Doubter. And that is, you don't understand the word of God. Because the believer who is alive when the rapture happens he has still experienced death because he was what? Those of you have been in this church long enough, known Romans chapter 6. We are crucified, buried, but raised to newness of life. All in who? Jesus Christ. All right. Let's quickly move on. I only got six more pages so I'm going to move on no I'm not I'm on the second to the last page second 
Some unbelievers were coming into the service at Corinth who were demon-possessed or greatly influenced by demon spirits. As a result, when the Spirit of God would move in the, serving, uh, in the service along with the believers glorifying God, some of the unbelievers were cursing Jesus. They were getting up and pronouncing judgment or getting up and saying something that was not right about the Lord. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Over the years of ministry, at times when the Holy Spirit's really moved, there's been someone in the pews who will stand up and maybe start speaking in tongues, which is completely not moving with the flow of the Holy Spirit, especially if it comes down to an altar call where people are on the verge of giving their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. See, God does everything in order, and He will not, will not stop the moving of the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit is wooing with a great anointing to bring that person to Christ. But see, if you have something that goes on, something crazy, somebody says, I got a word of wisdom, all while that's going on, oftentimes, you know, I'm not saying they're not saved, but they're not being led of the Holy Spirit, they're being led by their own spirit. And that can happen. Thirdly, there is the unscriptural heresies in the charismatic world which proclaims that Jesus took a sinful nature and that he died spiritually on the cross and took on the nature of Satan himself so that he could pay the penalty of our salvation. And now hear me out because you understand where I'm going with this. They claim that he did this by dying and going to the burning side of hell as do all unbelievers and was born again in hell thereby becoming the firstborn of many brethren. Which that Scripture where it says firstborn of many brethren does not mean he was born again that they teach. This teaching is nowhere found in the Bible. It's completely satanic in its origin. What that means in the Greek is firstborn means first and foremost, first in position. Not that Jesus had to be born again. If that was the case, he couldn't have been the Savior. You understand? They are saying, in other words, in effect they are saying that Jesus is accursed. So the battle cries of error and truth has always been Jesus is anathema or cursed or Jesus is Lord. He cannot be both. Jesus was cursed by God not as a sinner, this is the key, but as the penalty for our sins. Look at Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. In the Greek where it says being made a curse for us, in other words, being made the sin offering. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree. That was in the Old Testament. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That's the difference. Because had Jesus become sin, who would have saved him? You see, the types in the Old Testament all had to be without spot and blemish. In fact, that's why it was an innocent animal, because all animals are innocent. They don't have a, uh, a sin nature whatsoever. But like Leah did taught and did a good job at it, that when you brought the lamb for your sin that you just did last week because you were real mean to your husband, you had to, the priest gave you a knife, and you had to cut that lamb's throat yourself. It's kind of hard to do, especially if that was a nice little lamb. And lamb... One thing about sheep, they are very gentle. You can easily make a pet out of them. Did that the lamb deserve to have its throat cut? No. But that shows you the seriousness of sin and that God had to make a way for us. And who's to say, I'll just throw out this out there for all you animal activists that might by chance be listening, saying, oh, terrible that God would take those innocent animals and brutally kill them by the millions and millions and millions. Wait, who's to say that they're not over in heaven already? God didn't intend for animals to die. Never did. I'll just let you ruminate on that. See, there's an animal connotation again. See if you can figure that out. And that no man can say, I'm getting ready to close, that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Spirit, again, tells us several things. First, it is the Holy Spirit who reveals the Lordship of Christ to the believer. 
The moment the believing sinner comes to Christ, the divine nature is imparted, which is the reason, person and presence of the Holy Spirit, who immediately begins to glorify Christ. Look at John chapter 16, verse 14 real quick. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. In other words, the Holy Spirit, when moment you're converted, the Holy Spirit points you to glorify Christ. Never him. We don't glorify the Holy Spirit. We don't pray to, uh, to the Holy Spirit. Now, is the Holy Spirit God? Yes, He is. But He gets glory and honor and praise by what? Us glorifying and honoring and praising the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Second, anything and everything that one knows about Christ is revealed by the Holy Spirit. You don't even get saved without the Holy Spirit revealing that A, you're a sinner, you need to be saved, and B, that Christ was and is the one who died on the cross to redeem you and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. You may not be able to, when you got saved, probably couldn't put that all in that kind of uh, theological text but and doctrinal correct, correct text, but the, the point is, you basically, and did, not just basically, but you did, even in its simplest form, believe what I just said. Boom, you were saved. Immediately born again, given a new nature. Second, like I said, anything and everything we know comes about Christ is revealed by the Holy Spirit. The baptism with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues is clearly, closely associated with the Lordship of Christ. Now, I'm going to say this. Five times it's talking about when the apostles were preaching the gospel, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Three explicitly says they spake with another tongue. That was not the born-again experience because on two occasions they were already believers. They were baptized in John's baptism of repentance. They had already accepted Christ. They knew He was the Messiah. But they had not heard whether there be a Holy Ghost, remember? And when the apostles laid hands on them, boom, they spake with another tongue. It's as the Spirit gives utterance. I'm going to go delve deeply into this, and you'll see where the demarcation line is being led of the Spirit and being led of another spirit, or by your spirit, but in many cases it's another spirit. That is why I say the charismatic movement as a whole is a counterfeit. And we'll get into that, so stay tuned. See, the reason being that Jesus is the baptizer, Shannon come up with the Holy Spirit, we find that in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. Look at that. And indeed... I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. This is John talking. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I. He was referring to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the promised Redeemer, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, I wish I'd have thought to put this scripture in, but remember when Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will baptize you into me. It's in the Gospels. It's recorded. So what Jesus was referring to is the Holy Spirit, when He convicts you and draws you, He will baptize you into my death, burial, and resurrection. In that instance, the agent is the Holy Spirit. The element, think of like water, but the element is Christ. Literally, the Holy Spirit is placing you in Christ the moment you're converted. Are you saved? Yes, you are. Is the Holy Spirit living in your life? Yes, He is. You can't be a born-again person without the Holy Spirit being in there, bearing witness that you are now born again. But the very next verse, then Jesus, Jesus says, then I will baptize you in the Holy Ghost with fire. Now Jesus is the agent, and the element is the Holy Spirit. The first one is the salvation, born-again experience. That's the baptism in the Christ. The second is the empowerment, the baptizing in the Holy Spirit to empower you for service. Whatever that place is that God has you in His body. And I'm bringing this to a close. Finally, the baptism with the Holy Spirit is potential in nature. It is not guaranteed at all. It depends on the cooperation of the believer with the Holy Spirit. And this is what I mean by that. You will not receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit if you don't want it. Does that mean you're not saved? No, you're saved. Remember, the Holy Spirit's a person. He's not parcel and parted out. You know, I get part of him at salvation, I get the rest of him at the baptism. No, that's not it at all. That's crazy. That's, that's wackadoodle theology. He's God. He's present in your life. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is you saying, I want to be led and moved on and led by the Holy Spirit 
to glorify Jesus Christ. That's it. But now, even if you have the baptism with the Holy Spirit, and it always is with the evidence of speaking in another tongue, that's the charismatic thing or some who just don't believe that you can have the baptizing, baptism without speaking in other tongues. You don't see that in the book of Acts anywhere or in Paul's epistles where they received it, they spoke with another tongue, but it's as the Spirit gives evidence. You may say, well, brother, why, why the tongues? Why tongues? Well, I think James gave us some insight into that. He said, of all the members of the body, it's the smallest, but it does the most damage. The tongue. Armies have hit the field and wage war because of the tongue. People have been destroyed from childhood because of the tongue. People have been defamed because of the tongue. I remember it was 20-something years ago, that teacher in Alpharetta. has been teacher of the year once or twice. may have been twice. 20 years of teaching. Two 17-year-old girls in high school said he uh, uh, assaulted them and molested them and everything. Long story short, he was arrested, had a record. His wife left him, but he had a good lawyer. And eventually, after about a year or two, those girls admitted they made it up because he had failed them on the final exam. Shame on his wife for leaving him. And he said, you know what? I always love to teach, but he said, I will never teach again. This has cost me everything. What did that? The unwieldy and uncircumcised power of the tongue. And what I mean by uncircumcised, had not been controlled by the Holy Spirit. I think that's one reason. We speak in another tongue when we receive the baptism. And just for another reason too, and, and I'll expound more on this when we get to this. Even when we're following the Lord and we pray in our own language, sometimes we don't know what to pray for, do we? In fact, I think was it James again who says we have, or was it Peter who says we have not because we pray amiss, meaning we... We're maybe praying for selfish reasons or reasons we don't even know or we're missing the mark somehow. And there's at times when the Holy Spirit prays for you, it's because He is interceding and He's not going through your intellect here because He's completely praying and interceding, it says, on your behalf, unobstructed. Now that being said, stick with me through these series of messages. Now, this was three verses. Next week it's 11, and it's not going to take two hours because we'll go through them fast. I'm laying the foundation here. But as we are in these last, the last hours of the last minutes of the last days, I think we need the moving and the gifts of the Holy Spirit more than ever. You need words of wisdom and words of knowledge. Our young people do. Us older folks do. I, as your pastor, do. We, as your associate pastor does. We all need that. And it's not so we can go, I'm super Johnny Christian here. No. It's so we edify the body because we're all in the body. Now, that being said, I want Jennifer um, Tawny to come down here. We're going to pray. She's got a meeting. She can share with you what it's about. If not, but let's pray that God give her wisdom. She needs wisdom. And James, yeah.
is a lie. Let's come up and let's just anoint Jennifer with oil and that God give her the right words to say. Just bathed and, and, and just drenched in love with the right words. Let's pray for that. Amen. Because it's, it's a lying, it's a seducing spirit. And we're just going to bind that right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Father. We come to you in the name of Jesus and we bind this lying spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. We bind every lie, every, every thought, every feeling that's unlike Christ that goes against your word. And Father, we just loose that the Holy Spirit move in her life right now that brings conviction, brings clarity, and that she repents and comes back to you. And we're standing on your word, God. You still have a great work for her. You have not rec recanted or recalled the gifts because the Bible says the gifts and calling are without repentance from God. In other words, he doesn't repent of it. He doesn't take it back. So, Father, we pray that you give Jennifer just an unbelievable your wisdom, oh God, bathed in love, and her sister-in-law, that she has the same wisdom, that they speak in the same authority, with the same love of Jesus Christ, and with clarity and with your wisdom, Father, that will confound anything that her sister would come up with. And Lord, we just praise you and thank you, and we believe you for this restoration of her life, of who she is in Christ, and the rejection of what the world says she is. In Jesus' name we pray. And we believe and we thank you for this. And the church said, amen and amen. Yes, glory be to the Lamb. All right. Let's come back down here, Joe. We want to pray for, is it Patricia? Come on down here, Patricia. believe that. Stand firm on his word. He loves you. And he'll never let you down. And this church, Lee and I, anytime you need someone, I don't care if it's in the middle of the night, you need someone just to talk to. If you, if you can't get hold of your mother and dad, we're here. As your pastors. We love you. I really do. And God's got a plan for you. He's never deterred from it. y'all are dismissed go in the fear and the admonition of the Lord and expect great things from God now that being said as he moves and does great things in our life don't think the battle is going to lessen up you're going to be in a battle but Christ has given us the victory amen <laughs>